Yes, yes, I'm doing the proper. Sakura chance ah. feeling to get not weeble. Am I a fucking weeble? Tell me, woman. Damn it, tell me, am I a weeble? Am I a weeble? Have I lost my shit? Have I just went over my head? So, a lot of you guys responded quite well to my video talking about why the far right love Japan. And that video basically discussed why a lot of these people on this section of the right wing see Japan as a society to emulate and why they might love their history. So that's a good video to go check out before you watch this one. But this one's mainly going to focus on Japan's soft power and primarily the role weeaboos and weebs play in this and how they help Japan present to the world a certain image, but this helps cover up a lot of the controversial stuff Japan is doing, the controversial makeup of their government, which is hard right nationalist, lots of the policies they implement, and lots of the things they believe, especially the ruling party right now. So weeb stuff can often, you know, veer into racist stereotypes and I think there was a video I made before talking about Logan Paul going to Japan and how he was sort of annoying all these Japanese people, basically seeing them as caricatures who are just very humble and respectful and love things like Pokemon. Of course, that is a problematic aspect to weeaboos. But in general, Weeb's obsession with Japan, I guess, comes from a positive place. And what they generally do is take, I guess, more positive elements of Japanese society and maybe use that to paint it as a whole. And then what happens, just like with the US and soft power they use through things like Hollywood and the entertainment industry, you have other countries, including Western countries, have a certain image and a certain view of Japan, which might not necessarily be the truth. But before we go any further, if you like my content and you want to support it, please like the video, maybe subscribe to the channel, maybe share the video, if you want to support my work on Patreon, check out the link in the description. Nearly every single video I do is demonetized. Also check out my social media links and my podcast in the description. So some of you might be wondering, what is a weeb? What is a weeaboo? So just a quick definition from Vice, maybe just to frame this conversation. So over the past 10 years or so, weebs or the weaponies have been identified by commenters as essentially a non-Japanese person who basically denounces their own culture and calls themselves Japanese. People who want to be Japanese but aren't. And I guess weeaboo doesn't strictly mean this. I guess colloquially we sort of use it as just a guy who is maybe obsessed with Japanese culture, maybe not necessarily wanting to be Japanese themselves. Maybe they're obsessed with anime, maybe they're obsessed with K-pop or Japanese cinema. But in general, weebs help fetishize Japan and really spread these positive artistic achievements, I guess, of Japan. So anime, manga, and these things are good. And I'm not saying you can't like these things. Personally, myself, I like, you know, a fair few Japanese things. So Hideo Kojima's video games I really love, even though they are a bit westernized. So, you know, things like Metal Gear Solid, of course, a lot of the games Nintendo makes and a lot of great stuff they've put out, including, you know, Sony's Japanese offerings as well. So I'm not, you know, someone who says you can't like Japanese stuff. I'm not so big on manga and anime myself. I have seen some okay ones, of course. If you're about my age, 24, 25, you grew up with things like Pokemon. And, you know, around the 1980s is when Japan started to really get a massive cultural foothold of habit back in the day in the 50s with all the samurai films coming out of Japan. But, you know, it really took hold in the 1980s. Combined with Japan's rise of prominence as this massive global economy. And, of course, if you watch films like Blade Runner and a lot of cyberpunk is inspired by Western fears that Japan was going to take over the global economy and replace the US. Now I referenced soft power before, so you guys do understand what soft power is. Essentially it's how a superpower or just a general world power projects an image and helps get people on their side. So in the US's case, you can imagine because of things like Marvel, because of Captain America, lots of superhero movies, Lots of children and young people around the world love America and America's image gets projected in a positive way around you know, the globe. So you'd even have kids in Palestine and Vietnam really like American culture. And it's not just film, of course, music, TV, loads of different things, including stuff like video games as well, helps portray America in a positive light. And that is very, very useful to America and to countries like Britain as well 
because it allows us to frame the whole global conversation and don't underestimate how important soft power is to framing the world as you know west good so us uk good countries like iran or you know rogue states we don't like like venezuela as bad not to say these countries don't have things wrong with them but it's always interesting to see how we talk about our own countries compared to those of the rogue states even though in some cases we are actually a lot worse so japan has this going for it and as a test i asked a few people i know what do you think of japan and not many negative things came up and i think a, an ignorance in the west about japan and japan's history also helps combined with the soft power but gives us a general positive view of Japan, the Japanese government, Japanese society and Japanese culture as a whole. Now Japan can have positive qualities but in this video I'm going to delve into a lot of the negative qualities it has. So let's start with politics, let's start with the government. What people might not realise is that Japan has a very, very right-wing government, obviously led by Shinzo Abe until a couple months back, but we're going to go through some articles and we're going to talk about how problematic the government is. I'm going to incorporate some of the research I did for my master's degree on Japan and Chinese relations to talk about various controversies in history and how Japan denies them or downplays them, and it's a source of tension throughout you know, the region with South Korea and China especially, and it mainly relates to the Sino-Japanese War, and it also relates to the Second World War. So the Jacobin wrote a good article when Abe resigned, just talking about his legacy. So let's just talk about the political landscape of Japan quickly. So behind Abe's longevity, more than anything else, was the absence of meaningful opposition, both from the outside and within. His Liberal Democratic Party has enjoyed almost unbroken rule since it first took control in 1955. Since then, it's been thrown out of power through popular elections only once in 2009 when the leading opposition party, the Democratic Party of Japan, gained a mandate from voters who were exhausted by the LDP scandals, policy failures and merry-go-round of prime ministerial duds. So Abe actually has an interesting family history. So listen to this guy who was his grandfather who he constantly praised. Abe is often said to hold his maternal grandfather, Nobusuka Kishi, in high regard. The same probably couldn't be said of the residents of Manchuria during the years that Kishi led its economic development as a Japanese colony. An arch nationalist who praised the Nazis, he was responsible for the brutally enforced high-speed industrialization drive bolstered by the opium trade in which conscripted Chinese laborers, whom he likened to dogs, worked under heinous conditions. Some factories had to replace more than half their workers annually because the death rate was so high. Later, as munitions minister, Kishi oversaw the forced migration of thousands of Koreans and Chinese to work in factories within Japan itself. The majority of these forced laborers did not survive, after the war, Kishi was set to be tried for Class A war crimes, but the Americans, finding him useful, released him before he went on trial, enabling him to take part in politics again. By 1957, he was Japan's Prime Minister. And just to put a pin in that quick, this is going to point out a larger issue in Japanese culture, where thanks to things like you just heard, the Americans rebuilding Japan, they haven't really apologised for World War II in a significant way and they actually continually honour people who were war criminals but just were never found guilty in an international court of law. Now Abe wasn't exactly the same as his grandfather but there's some similarities so the main one which a lot of people point out is that Abe was a member of the Nippon Kaigi. Now the Jack have been going on to say that this is a secretive association that aims to revise the constitution and place the emperor at the center of the nation. It wants to build Japanese pride and prosperity without letting inconveniences like civil liberties get in the way. And if you've been following Japanese politics over the last decade, you will know Abe specifically and his party have been trying to rewrite the Japanese constitution to change it so they can have an active military again instead of a self-defense force and get rid of, I think it's Article 9, which renounces war as a concept. And thank you, Hideo Kojima, for teaching me all about that in Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. And they're trying to be more aggressive. And from what you've heard about the Nippon Kaigi, it seems like a movement to kind of take Japan back to its fascist military dictatorship in certain elements from the Second World War. So in some of the literature that they have published, they promote family values, sort of like Republicans, women in the kitchen, that Jacobin says, 
and they want to revive the imperialist notions of racial superiority and deny, deny the Nanking Massacre of 1937 in China. For several years, Abe was mired in a funding scandal around a nationalist private kindergarten run by a fellow Nippon Kaigi member that had its students visiting military bases, bowing to an image of the emperor and reciting an oath of loyalty associated with the education system under the Japanese empire. So just how widespread is the membership of this organization? So at some point, 18 out of 20 of Abe's cabinet members were part of it and one of them, Tomomi Inada, then the party policy chief, had posed for a photo with Yamada Kazunuri, the leader of a neo-Nazi group. Another, Taro Aso, then deputy prime minister, remarked that Hitler was wrong in murdering millions of people, but his motives were right. He's also on record for saying that the Nazis did a good job gutting the Weimar constitution and obviously worrying because this party wants to rewrite Japan's own constitution. So the organization has about 40,000 members and it has a big reach in politics, so it has obviously the Prime Minister used to be a member, but you know Shinto religious organisations is another. 60% of parliamentarians are members of the Nippon Kaigi, and they use their networks to rally voters to the polls. Now here's a big one which I want to incorporate my master's work on. So 20 years ago, all mainstream history books at secondary schools carried information about the comfort women, now none do. Now another part of Japanese politics that points to its history and its failure to reconcile with other countries in the region and really take responsibility for its own past is the Yaksuni Shrine, which prime ministers and leaders visit and this is a shrine that honors many war criminals who fought in the second Sino-Japanese war and you know, following on for that World War II. So this shrine is located in Tokyo and commemorates Japanese war dead from various conflicts. The Japanese government knowingly put the names of several class A war criminals in the shrine who were convicted by the International Military Tribunal following the end of World War II. This action was controversial in its time with the head priest of the shrine delaying the acceptance of war criminals until his death in 1978. Once they had been put in, even Emperor Hirohito never visited the shrine again. Now, since 1978, four prime ministers of Japan have visited the shrine, including Shinzo Abe, which has outraged the Chinese. And the only reason Abe really stopped going is because North Korea started ramping up tensions with Japan, so he felt it was in his best interest to stop infuriating the Koreans and stop infuriating the Chinese because North Korea were conducting ballistic missile tests and would launch the rockets near Japan. Now hearing about the politics of Japan in that way may be quite surprising to people because I feel in general that Japan has a very very positive image on the world stage and in western countries and I think weebs and weeaboos are guilty of promoting Japan as a positive place you know overall to Western countries and Western liberals in general. So because weeaboos often promote manga and anime and things that might be seen as, you know, I guess pieces of art that reflect sexual liberalization, Japan actually does have a massive problem with feminism and the Me Too movement there. We have awful problems with it as well, but you know, I guess people might be surprised to hear how bad it is in Japan considering weebs help portray this image that maybe it's quite like a tolerant place, although I would argue that anime and manga can be extremely problematic with their depictions of women. So someone who kicked off the Me Too movement in Japan prominently in the media world was a woman called Shihiro Ito. So in 2015, Ito met a 26-year-old journalist called Nuriyuki Yamaguchi, who was a well-connected veteran television reporter and TBS bureau chief in Washington. They met for dinner in Tokyo in April 2015, and after drinking with Yamaguchi, Ito suffered a memory blackout. She later suspected that Yamaguchi had spiked her drinks. Police investigators and journalists reconstructed, sub reconstructed subsequent events from the testimonies of a taxi cab driver and a doorman at the hotel where Yamaguchi was staying and from the hotel's security footage. Now this case was initially thrown out despite the overwhelming evidence because this guy was well connected, including to members of the government, but in 2019, she won a civil case against him. And like I said, while we do have a sexism problem in the West and specifically Britain, and it's normally covered up by the establishment, it's still pretty brazen in Japan. Here is a little report from International Viewpoint. So the string of injustices against women continued. On 12th of March 2019, a man was found not guilty of having sex with a woman who was drunk and incapacitated in the southern Japanese city of Fukuoka. The case was overturned later. A man was sentenced to four years in prison. 
on March 19th, the Shizuko District Court in central Japan found another man innocent on charges of forcing a woman to have sex. The courts ruled that in both cases, the woman had failed to resist enough for the man to notice there was a lack of consent. Another case in Nagoya District Court found a father not guilty of sexually abusing his teenage daughter repeatedly for two years. Although the court accepted that the man had sexually abused his daughter, it ruled that there was still doubt that she lost the complete ability to resist. In other words, she showed no physical signs of abuse that would indicate her resistance. Now, thankfully, this has prompted a massive movement of feminists in Japan. So that's another element of Japanese society, I guess it goes under the radar, that it has inherent sexism, just like Western countries, but in some cases, it actually is a bit worse. Now, to get more economic, Japan is also pretty hyper-capitalist, and the work culture it has is extremely toxic. Now, as someone who is a worker myself, I can tell you that it's not unique to Japan, but what Japan is quite well known for is people being overworked and obviously people committing suicide from being overworked. So much so it actually has quite a globally recognized term for this phenomenon. So Nobuko Kobayashi reporting in 2018 for Nikkei Asia saying, Japan's suicide tallies remain far too high. The recent declines only put the country back to early 1990s levels before Japan's prolonged economic stagnation hit hard. According to data by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Japan's suicide rate of 16.6 .6 for every 100,000 persons ranks third among the group of 20 states behind only South Korea and Russia. To put that into perspective, Japan lost six times more people to suicide than to traffic accidents in 2017. So it goes on to say, overwork is such a big problem in Japan that Kuroshi Death from overwork has become an internationally recognized word. When you hear those figures, it does seem to be, I guess, representative of a general capitalist economy, but then you sprinkle, I guess, Japanese culture in general and maybe the hypercapitalism of Japan, and it creates so much more toxic conditions for people. Worker suicide and having this whole phenomenon of being overworked to the point of killing yourself is quite unique to Japan. I would say in maybe Western countries, it obviously factors in overwork and hopelessness from work. But I guess I feel in Western countries more so that suicide isn't just directly coming from work. Work is part of the equation. So I feel like groups in the West idealize two contrasting images of Japan. So you have the far right. They love Japan because of Japan's stance on immigration. They don't allow a lot of immigrants into the country. They don't have a lot of immigrants into the country. They don't accept many refugees. They're one of the worst countries in the world for that. And they're pretty ethnically homogenous. Most people in Japan are Japanese. So the far right are like, yeah, we want a bit of that. Look at Japan. Look at how successful they are. It's because they are ethnically homogenous. And the political aspects I've been talking about, the historical revisionism, the sort of idealizing the fascist history of Japan. I guess the far right love that as well, but contrast that I feel with the weeaboo image of Japan, the weebs image, which helps spread the positive elements of Japan, the positive cultural traits, but their obsession where they want to be Japanese. They put Japan as a society, as a country on this pedestal where it seems like, I guess, paradise. It seems like utopia for the weebs. I think what that helps do for Japan in terms of soft power is to liberals, to leftists, to centrists, it portrays this image of them, which is largely very, very positive, but also it helps spread ignorance about Japan. You know, I'm sure a lot of you are informed about the politics of Japan, but I wouldn't be surprised if many of you didn't know the stuff about their ruling party, about the government, about Shinzo Abe, about the group that he's a part of. And then you have things like, you know, the Me Too movement in Japan and the working culture. And I just feel that weeaboo culture and weeaboos online sanitize all these problems and you don't hear about them much. And maybe that's a problem with Western media not focusing on the East and focusing on countries that maybe aren't as important to us. But I think with Japan more so than India, Japan has a lot of fans, has a lot of weebs, has a lot of people who will promote this country as something to strive for. And I think the far right and weebs both do it. And what happens is we just don't know enough about this country and we just accept it as, you know, 
Isn't Japan a wonderful place, wonderful culture, exports all these positive cultural things just like the Americans, but that is how they export the image they want around the world. And I feel like weebs just lap this up. So anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Please like the video, maybe subscribe to the channel. If you want to follow me on social media, at The Cavernacle on Twitter and Instagram. You know, if you want to support my work, my Patreon is also in the description. Remember, all my videos are demonetized because I like bringing you guys this type of content. Also, join my subreddit, r slash for Cavernacle. Follow my personal reddit, u slash Tommy Cahill, 1995. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.